Thank you very much, Sarah. Good morning, good uh, afternoon, and good evening to everyone. My name is Farina So, a principal deputy director of the Documentation Center of Cambodia, a research institute that works to document uh, the Khmer Rouge atrocity that took place in 1975 and 1979. Um, in the purpose of memory, justice, and reconciliation. And I'm very delighted to be a moderator for this panel, uh, which is on innovation and maintenance of digital archives. The purpose of this panel uh, is to look at best practices um, in the technical development of archives. As Sarah mentioned, we have panelists uh, on this panel and they come from a very uh, different geographical location and have a wide range of experience in documentation, archival management, uh, database training, uh, information sharing. So um, I would like to introduce uh, our panelists as follow. The first one on the list is Yvonne Eng. Yvonne is the Archives Program Manager at Witness, where she trains and supports partners on collecting, managing, and preserving video documentation for human rights advocacy and evidence. She also develops training resources related to archiving and preservation. She is currently an advisor for the Memory Lab Network and Open Archive. Our next panelist is Oscar Montiel. Oscar works for the NGN Room, an international organization that helps activists, organizations, and other social change agents make the most of data and technology to increase their impact. He is specialized mostly in facilitating human interactions to develop technology and processes of better governance through open data Recently, he has worked with the Central the SDO uh, Call Cells, an organization in Argentina that has been documenting and archiving since 1974 to the present by assisting them in on creating a uh, Valencia policial. Miguel Cisai. Miguel is currently responsible for information technology at the Memorial Para La Concordia, Memorial for Concord, in its project, Memorial Virtual Guatemala, Guatemala Virtual Memory, which includes 45 organizations and institutions working on issue of historical memory and with the victim of the internal um, conflict in Guatemala. Our next panelist is Nicola Mokrovic. Nicola has been working in Documenta Center for Dealing with the Past since uh, 2010 as archivist, data manager of the organization Archival Records and Collections, and as a researcher on project of human losses in war in Croatia in 1991-1995. His professional interests include accessibility of information and developing the mechanism of transitional justice. Last but not least, Nisai Hong. Nisai is the director of Tulsa Line Genocide Museum in Cambodia. It is the memorial site of S21, interrogation and detention center of the Khmer Rouge regime. He has progressed from an administrative to local tour guide, to chief of exhibitions and research at the museum to the director there. He has worked on developing mobile exhibitions that visit several schools across Cambodia. So welcome uh, our panelists. And what I would like to do is for the first part of the panel discussion, I have specific question for each panelist. And uh, if you could uh, make your response uh, within seven minutes, that would be great. So the first question uh, would go to Yvonne. So given your long-term experience in archival management and training at Witness, 
what are your strategy and procedure in training partner organization to collect, manage, and preserve video documentation to protect and defend human rights? Um, thank you. Thank you so much for the question, Frida. It is amazing to be here with all of you. I'm so happy to have been invited and included, so thank you. Um, just to, um, before I give my response, just a little bit of um, background for context. Um, so what we do at WITNESS is to um, support um, mostly grassroots organizations and activists who are using video to document um, human rights violations for um, evidence and advocacy purposes. So as part of that, we conduct archival trainings. And those range um, you know, from one time three hour workshops to, for mixed audiences to longer multi day intensive trainings with a single partner. So the shorter trainings are usually done, you know, for the purposes of network building, knowledge sharing, supporting our peers, whereas the more intensive trainings usually take place in the context of a longer term partnership with a group that we're supporting on other aspects um, of their advocacy work. So the archiving and preservation is part of the approach to helping them achieve their advocacy goals. And so we might provide other resources beyond just training in that kind of situation. But onto the question. Um, so, you know, yesterday um, we were talking about uh, in all the panels how organizations may have um, multiple overlapping needs. So it's not just funding, it's not just training, it's not just technology. Um, so for us, when we, um, decide to do an intensive training, uh, I think a really important step bef before undertaking the training is working with the partner to assess their capacity for even taking on an archival project and, and understanding what they need, you know, versus what we uh, as witness can realistically um, support them with. So in many cases, we've had this discussion and determined that the time maybe wasn't right because there weren't the other internal pieces in place um, that, were, that were needed first before a training could take place, um, or that it didn't make sense right now because there were other priorities and limited resources. And I just wanna say like that, that is okay. It's more important for us that we don't set up people up to fail. Um, it's really important to be clear about how much work is involved in archiving. And I think a lot of people you know, here today are very well aware of that but it's not always really obvious. Um, and, and to be clear about how much support beyond training that they can expect from us or that we can help them um, find from other sources. But in terms of the training itself, you know, whether it's a shorter or a longer training, what we typically cover is, um, first of all, talking about why archiving is important. You know, what are the goals of the project? Um, what do we intend or aspire these archives to be used for? That's really important to cover first um, in all of our trainings. Um, and then basically we will walk through the main functional areas of archiving and, and talk about how the partner might do each of those functional areas in their given context. So we'll talk about um, selection. So what do you collect and what don't you collect? Um, and often we're working with groups who are um, filming video, who are creating the video documentation. So we'll talk about like, what do you film or what do you capture and how do you film effectively? Next, um, we'll talk about the ingest process. So how do you get the content and bring it into your custody? Um, how do you uniquely identify it? What preservation actions do you take on it? Um, such as digitization, as we talked about yesterday. Um, and then how do you also, how do you document those preservation actions? Um, we'll talk about description and data management. So what data models are you using? What cataloging rules should you follow? What database tools should you use? Um, we'll talk about storage. So like, how do you store and back up effectively? Um, what storage media or services suit your needs? Um, we'll talk about preservation planning. So how will you address the longer term considerations like obsolescence or storage migration? 
And then finally, we'll talk about access or your intended uses. So how will the users retrieve those records from your archive? And what do those users need to identify, understand, and interpret those records properly? Um, and of course, all the trainings are tailored to the specific needs, so there might be more of an emphasis on some parts than others. Um, but just in terms of some strategies, general strategies that we found have been effective. Um, first of all, I think it's really important to bring knowledge of standards to a training. But as the trainer, you need to be knowledgeable enough about the principles behind the standards um, to know what you can be flexible with and what you can't. Um, you really need to be able to answer the trainee's question of why do I need to do this, especially something that will take a lot of effort, like why should they do that and why is it important and what don't they have, what can they, what can they not do if they don't have the resources. Um, Secondly, you know, while of course, um, you know, we come to a training prepared to explain different workflows and tools and approaches, um, it's really useful as part of the training to, uh, to co-develop goals and policies through guided exercises that are part of the training. So for instance, co uh, collaboratively developing collection policies, um, data models, cataloging rules. Um, this not only helps uh, ensure the appropriateness of the approach, um, but it also helps to foster deep understanding of why choices are made and, and uh, fosters buy-in for the participants in that process. Um, and then finally, I think documentation of the outputs of your training are really important. So if you co-develop a collection policy or cataloging rules, um, having that as something that comes out of your training. And what really helps, uh, you know, a practical tip that helps for that is um, creating worksheets and templates that you do as part of your exercises so that you're filling them in together. And then at the end, you have this well-documented um, policies that you created together. Um, so yeah, so those are just some, some thoughts and reflections on, on the experiences we've had with, with training. Thank you very much, uh, Yvonne, uh, for sharing your uh, working strategy um, that I did from identifying the, uh, the capacity uh, of the trainees and, and all of those. And then uh, until, uh, I mean, it looks like this life cycle of all the information and uh, that you have shared uh, with partner organization. Okay. Um, Maybe we can go to our next panelist and uh, we're going to hear more uh, from our uh, speaker, um, Oscar. Um, so I also have questions for you. Uh, so as a regional specialist in facilitating human interaction to develop technology and process, of better governance through open data at the engine room. Uh, how does your organization help civil society in developing their database? And what kind of innovative approach that you have taken in your work? Thank you. Thank you, Farina. And uh, first of all, thank you to um, all the organizations who are hosting this meeting. Um, it's really great talking to all of you. So yes, I will talk to you a little bit about the process of supporting the Centro de Estudios Legales y Sociales, CELS, in Argentina, uh, through the Engine Rooms Matchbox program. In this program, we basically provide pro bono long-term support to organizations that require uh, technical, uh, like data-related or, in general, um, project um, management support uh, on a specific topic or project. And uh, we follow a user-centered design approach to uh, develop this project. And to give you a little bit more context about this um, particular project, this archive or this database was born because there is a deficiency on production and access to official criminality statistics in Argentina. 
especially those related to security institutions. So in 1996, uh, the cells started building a database that watches cases of police violence uh, where there is at least one person injured or killed. Um, the source of this archive are published news from major outlets in the country, but sometimes they use other sources in case um, there are none in, the, in these major outlets. So the work we did was supporting CELS's effort to bring their archive uh, that lived on a specific computer with old software that was developed back then in 1996, and their, its latest update wasn't very, um, it happened a long time ago as well. So the, the challenge was bringing that archive into an online and open source platform. Uh, shout out to Huey Docs for building Owazi. Uh, the, and the question from the beginning was how to bring this, all this data that was very well established into a new structure uh, while maintaining the methodological soundness that CELS has developed over the years and make it work as a, as a new online platform. And the most important part of this, as with any project that we do, was that CELS had the technical capabilities to grow and maintain this archive uh, once we finished the, the implementation. As usual, the technological part was the last step, even though it wasn't the easiest or the shortest. Um, but understanding the needs and goals uh, of the organization, as Yvonne has already mentioned, was uh, the most important uh, step for us. So to achieve this, the first step we took was understanding the data and tech capabilities of the organization. Then we mapped uh, a landscape of similar initiatives. Uh, we did interviews with some of these organizations or groups that uh, archive um, this type of human rights violations or had some similar approach to uh, capturing data and then bring those lessons into a work plan that would allow us to migrate the database into OASI. Uh, this led to two different parts of the archive. The first one is the migrated database, which is self-hosted by cells on OASI. Um, and we migrated the information from the old database, uh, which wasn't easy to understand or populate into this new archive that is easily accessible by its main users and the volunteers that uh, work on it. But it will also allow cells to keep, to maintain the second part of the project or the second element of the project, which was a public facing website called Violencia Policial or Police Violence. Uh, which shows statistics about people who have died to, to, due to police violence, but also takes a step further, uh, not just showing the data or statistics, uh, but shows information uh, and life stories of victims of such uh, violence and covers important topics uh, like uh, police femicides. Uh, so it, it is a website that, who, which has the goal of growing as the database grows, sadly. But you know, uh, the idea is to keep using this data for the reports, publications, and research that they already do, uh, both internally and externally, while also pushing for better protection uh, of human rights and the implementation of policies to reduce violence in Argentina. Thank you very much, Oscar, um, for elaborating on um, how, the, how to support the organization in all this database. And one of the important things that you mentioned is uh, to understand the needs and goals of the organization first before providing solution. This is a very important point. Um, so, um, 
So we can move to um, Miguel um, as we want to know um, how um, his organization is able to cheaply uh, transfer all of its digital documents, file, and multiple websites from physical servers to online hosting, saving a lot of money and storage space in the process. Miguel, uh, if you could uh, address this, uh, that would be great for us. Thank you. Buenos dias uh, todos. Good morning, everyone. Can you see me? Please let me know. Good morning. Can anyone see me, please? Yes, we can see you and hear you. Thank you. I would like to start off um, by explaining that the Memorial for Concordia for uh, uh, agreement in Guatemala or, was born in 2010 and is dedicated mainly to projects regarding historical memory in regard to the armed conflict in Guatemala, which lasted 36 years. In 1996, the peace was signed, so we created a project, the Virtual Memory of Guatemala, which per, the purpose of which is to disclose the events that happened during the internal armed conflict. We, at the beginning, tried to use physical servers pertaining to your question, to store the information that we were accumulating and collecting from organizations that had to do with historical memory in Guatemala. The problem that we found was that the servers, the physical servers needed some sort of uh, special maintenance and they needed the services of uh, IT engineers and uh, graphic designers and uh, programmers, web programmers. And it turned out to be that all of those needs came to be a very large expense and a very large investment in the expenses of the different projects. So we tried to see how to solve them and uh, we hired the services of a virtual server in a company that gives these services in Guatemala. And uh, we had the same problems with the maintenance of software and uh, so that our websites could operate properly. We had a platform with seven websites. So at the end, we tried to see how we could reconvert all of these uh, tools into something simpler and not to see how the maintenance and setup of the servers didn't have to do with the the backups uh, the back backup copies that we needed to take in each website so after doing some research we were able to hire the services of a commercial host that would allow us to store our information. We hired two hosting services that allowed us to have up to 200,000 files in each service. So we have um, 45 organizations of civil society in Guatemala, and from them, 30 
organizations have websites and the others don't. So some use blogs or Google Drive to have their information and to be able to access it online. So we tried to migrate and we did it with our websites to these hosting services that were hired and we were able to do it ourselves, designing our websites, standardize, unifying the content managers. That also saved us a lot of resources because we didn't have to pay any website designers. We didn't have to pay the migration. And um, instead of using any independent domains for each of our websites, we used subdomains. So with that, we also saved having to find independent domains for each of the sites. From the organizations that don't have websites, we assumed or we were uploading the material to the hosting services we've hired. So it turns out that uh, what we had initially in 2010, starting in 2010 with physical servers versus what we have now, we are paying about 60 to $70 per hosting service to, uh, to store these. So instead of paying um, eight or ten thousand dollars a year to maintain those um, physical servers, so it turns out that after some research and migrating and using some other sources of content like YouTube for videos and other types of sources, we were able to distribute in a way the materials and to lower the expenses in physical servers to hostings that would allow us to even have some automated backups and to guarantee the security of the information. I think well, that's as far as we can get. Thank you very much, uh, Miguel. So this really adds on to uh, what Yvonne and Oscar uh, have mentioned um, about the needs and goal, not only about the needs and goal and capability of the organization and solution, but also cost effectiveness that um, you, uh, you have uh, thought of and then uh, already um, uh, work on that and um, it works well. And I'm sure we're gonna have a follow-up question on that uh, later. Um, so without further ado, uh, I would like to go uh, to our panelists, um, Nikola Mokrovic. Um, so Nikola, as a documenter or center for dealing with the past, um, document war that took place in Croatia between 1994 and 1995. Um, and given your experience, could you talk about your archival services and conceptual problems surrounding archiving? Thank you. Mm, Farina, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Nikola Mokrovic. I come from Zagreb based, uh, Croatia based civil society organization uh, called uh, Documenta. Uh, Documenta was uh, established uh, in 2005 as a documentation center, which, uh, with, uh, with had, which had a very clear mandate on documenting uh, various types of human rights violations that took place primarily in the uh, 90s, in the war in the 90s from 1991, 1995. And since its uh, beginning, Documenta was part of a larger initiative 
uh, for documenting um, these uh, gross human rights violations uh, because of the nature of the conflict uh, in uh, Croatia, which was uh, not, uh, we couldn't say it's a war for itself, but it was the war for the dissolution of Yugoslavia and included and that why includes uh, other countries such as uh, pra pra primary Serbia and Bosnia Herzegovina. So at the beginning, uh, so at the beginning, uh, Documenta's work was uh, pretty much, um, how to say, facilitated and supported by other uh, similar initiatives and similar organizations in the uh, in the region. Uh, that was especially important because of uh, the fact, because of the nature of this conflict, uh, data, documentation, sources, which are uh, have uh, huge importance in documenting, uh, for example, uh, human losses, which is our, we could say, uh, the most important project. They are uh, not all in uh, Croatia, okay, but uh, these sources uh, are, how we could say, are exist in other countries, primarily uh, Serbia. And um, we could say that um, organizations which are making this network are actually bridging the gap uh, between this cross border gap uh, in the sense that uh, we are primarily interested in uh, establishing the fates of the killed and uh, missing persons. And uh, we are, how to say, uh, devoid of any special political considerations that go with that. Because establishing the fate of the killed of missing persons is, of, is often, we could say, uh, is uh, mm, is not it's not a rational process due to our respective political elites. Um, so we are primarily concerned on the mm, and gather the records uh, that were created during the nineties, but uh, actually our uh, how to say the scope of uh, our archival records as total goes back to the uh, beginning of the Second World War because through various programs we gather various kinds of documentation. So strictly speaking, we are, as in classical archival terms, we are either creators of some archival records or we are custodians of some. So in that sense, we have acquired, we have acquired some archival records from some other civil society organizations in Croatia. Um, and in that way, we support the, we could say, the culture and the memory of all the alternative institutions that were uh, working in the 90s in Croatia. Our oral history project, which is uh, entirely digitally born archive, is uh, covers its scope is from 1941 to present day and i will if it's okay with you i would like to show you some of our services because uh, i think that uh, visual contact is will tell tell you more but so in that case uh, i would just um, how to say follow up on what uh, people before me were saying uh, we have uh, extensive, how to say, knowledge and know-how that was created uh, by us uh, by consulting like the good existing practices, and it also deals with uh, physical uh, physical records as much as it deals with the digital records. So actually, what we as Documenta was set up in two thousand and five. And I started working five years later. Actually, the biggest task was to ensure the transition from the paper-based uh, workflow to digital-based workflow. Okay, so in that sense, we were creating, uh, we were pretty ambitious at the time, and we were creating a lot of our uh, services like um, databases, 
and uh, document management system, systems, which were specifically tailored uh, for us. Okay. And of course, there is always this uh, cost benefit uh, analysis, which uh, of course should always encompass uh, the long term sustainability, but that's, that's, that's a separate uh, story. And um, another thing is that uh, we also understood in one moment that uh, we are not physically able to gather documentations from other organizations, but uh, we should also start, uh, how to say, a program of training of the other civil society organizations. And in that sense, we have published several manuals for archiving for civil society organizations. And we held a few trainings. And what is what is uh, especially interesting, we uh, entered a few collaborations, like few collaboration projects, which were uh, which were entailing uh, building a small scale digital archives. So, and if you're okay with that, now I would uh, share my screen with you. And um, first, just let me see. Okay, let me see. Uh, no. mm, so just uh, okay. I'll do it like this. Um, first, um, regarding our uh, regarding our database on uh, the fate of uh, killing and missing persons. Uh, the aim of this project is to create the name list of all the people uh, who were killed or, or either which uh, fate, or their fate is still unknown. And uh, this is, uh, we could say archival system, like this is a front end of our repository of the names uh, which have been confirmed. And uh, basically, um, he, here, here is the data from uh, three organizations at the moment. Uh, one is uh, Documenta, other is uh, Humanitarian Law Fund uh, Belgrade, and other is uh, Humanitarian Law uh, Fund uh, Center from uh, Pristina. And it was, uh, this system was uh, designed in a way that in uh, that the victims can be searched either through the name list okay through some typical categories or they can be uh, they can be accessed uh, through through the map like where the map serves as a sort of uh, as sort of a filter and um, at the moment, at the moment, this uh, this uh, this database only uh, con it contains some clusters of data. As far as documenta is concerned, uh, the data presented here is only experimental. It's dummy data, um, and uh, behind behind this, uh, the system which supports, which actually holds the data. Uh, looks something like this. Okay, so this is the typical, uh, we could say, uh, file of individual victims, of individual victim. Um, as you can see, the data structure, the data structure is uh, pretty much developed. I think that in total uh, we have uh, around uh, 80 uh, values that can be uh, entered. Um, this is like uh, the full. This is like the full uh, record, and we publicly we publicize only like the only the basic the basic uh, uh, set of data, and this is part uh, which is uh, this is part which is uh, DMS. So this is the part of the database which uh, basically holds the which holds the the documents and their metadata. Um, another. Um, Another project that I mentioned is our oral history repository, where we, during the course of five years, uh, have uh, recorded uh, five, 500 interviews, okay, and created, uh, created this repository, 
which allows uh, multiple layers of annotation. So it has um, each each video, each each testimony has its own basic description. First layer of annotation are the subtitles, which are in both in Croatian and in English, and it also allow annotation with um, with uh, with uh, chapters. So. Uh, So this is um, this is um, we could say our digital born uh, archive where we also had uh, the whole developed uh, we have developed the whole um, workflow for uh, for recording videos for their annotation and for their publication uh, regarding our collaboration projects which are concerned uh, with uh, things that are not necessary the domain of uh, of transitional justice is that uh, we have uh, for example uh, we were experimenting with creating something that we could call the human rights archive which would uh, contain records and data about civil society human rights and human rights initiatives from the 90s and here we used uh, the software which was co-created by international council on archives it's called it's atom it's um, it's a software which you can uh, download and uh, use free to use of course you need to have your administrator who, who knows database administrator who knows what he does and of course to have your uh, storage place but uh, as far as um, as far as uh, sorry um, as far as uh, standards and uh, cataloging uh, this is uh, this is what well, we could say ideal uh, ideal solution for the uh, for the um, archives uh, or for the organizations which, which want to make their records publicly available and it um, it um, it entails the all the basic standards such as ESAT and and uh, and so on and uh, it's pretty straightforward because it uh, at the same time it allows uh, uh, metadata creation and the holding of the uh, and the holding of the actual of uh, the actual records um uh, next thing that what we did was with which we were working on is a collaboration uh on dig digitizing some uh, independent newspapers and magazines from the 90s uh, here we were, we were uh, working with uh, Monoscope, which is like public repository for independent culture. And this was the process which also entailed creation of metadata, actual digitization of, of, um, of this magazine and um, the, whole, the whole process of post-processing post and so on. And it's also, that says pretty, uh, very simple and in like very very simple uh, to use. Um, this is, for example, a um, small archive that we created uh, while respecting all the standards of description. But uh, it is a um, small, how to say, uh, repository with exclusively one focus on um, one famous uh, journalist from Croatia. Uh, from the last century. Um, this couldn't be called a database, but it is only uh, but it's only a normal web page which uh, contains some basic data. So um, then uh, this is also one collaboration project which we had, uh, which been, which has been hosted on the memory of the world, the memory on the world uh, repository. And this was interesting case because we used a repository which is primarily uh, uh, by its structure of data, uh, primarily supports uh, books. We use it, uh, we use it uh, both for books and for the primary sources. And uh, 
uh, one one more uh, one more uh, how to say uh, product which is not uh, which is not ours but is also done by, by in collaboration with our close partner it sends uh, center is uh, something uh, that uh, was called um, uh, inter interactive narrative it is actually um, an agency or independent news agency that was uh, covering uh, the trials in hug and they they gathered uh, they gathered a vast amount of uh, documentation and they decided to put it in um, to put it online in a virtually in a how to say in a visually attractive way which uh, allows uh, which uh, and in that sense this repository allows um, the to hold some basic selection of data of videos and of uh, basic basic texts and uh, as far as um, as far as this uh, visual attractive uh, component which is uh which is how to say accessible to people is concerned this is probably one of the best uh visual products but uh, i would say that it's important to, to note that uh, behind uh, all these all these uh avail publicly available resources um as far as i'm concerned my bigger uh my bigger we could say a uh, challenge is the basic archival work that means a uh, basic uh, physical and archival organizations of the holdings and digitization uh thank you for now thank you very much nicola for sharing with us your practical works and uh, especially collaborative efforts on uh, database um, oral history and especially on uh, physical evidence uh, that you just last show um, us. And this is, uh, this resonates us with uh, what our keynote speaker yesterday mentioned about um, different types of documents, um, the hard copy and then uh, in a digital form. So this is something that we can uh, take away and uh, of course further discuss. Um, I would like to uh, go to our last panelist, um, Nisai. Um, Nisai asked, a, uh, you work as a director at a memorial site of S21 um, interrogation and its detention center um, under the Khmer Rouge regime, where between 12,000 to 14,000 prisoners were arrested, tortured, and extracted. A forced confession. How Tools Line Genocide Museum digitize uh, and maintain the forced confession and other physical evidence related to the administration of the security, security center and disseminate the archive to the public and seek justice for the victim. Yes, the floor is your Nisai. Thank you, uh, Ms. Farina So, and thank to the organizer to make this event happen and I'm very glad to see all of you from different parts of the world and working in almost similar fields is about collecting and carrying all the documents of the, the crimes and um, yes as um, Ms. Farina have mentioned about the the Two Slime Museum was a former S21 where at least 12,000 or between 12 and uh, 14 or lately it was estimated by the Khmer Rouge Tribunal it's like 18,000 people were imprisoned at the, at the site between 75 and 71 and those people were extract the forced confession before they were sent to be killed so people who entered S21 were known to be killed no one could almost survive and yes the documents which, which the museum remain today is all from those kind of confession a confession of a victim who were forced who were giving under the pre, under the, the the torture in a threat 
and the registration, the photographing or other forms of Khmer Rouge notes, notebooks and their policies, etc. Those documents are now have like more than 700 pages with in the, the museum today. So, and these 100, 700 pages of documents have been uh, registered to the memory of the world registered in 2009. So which means the documents of the museum have been known by the UNESCO as the heri document heritage. So lucky to towards line to have this opportunity to be part of the memory of the world. So we got at, at, uh, attention from the world to take care of this document heritage. Let me uh, briefly uh, describe to you how these documents are stored and uh, had been stored or how we took care of this uh, until the recent day. As you know that the museum was open right after the fall of the Khmer Rouge in 1979. And then at that time, as Khmer Rouge had no chance to destroy every document, so they have remains document in the in the compound of the museum, which is about now like one hectare. But before that, it was like hundred times of two nowadays. It's like hundred hectares around the, the 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 museum today. If you see now, it's like hundred times because the museum compound was quite big, as they used some houses around to be their tortured place, to be their offices, to be their uh, some part of it would be their killing place. It happened there. So in 1979, after that of that fall, many documents remain in houses around the places. So that the first work of the museum staff in 1979 and 80s was to collect those documents to be stored in one room where it be protected from the rain, from the the, the sun, and then in eight, uh, at the time, the staff were trying to classify the, the, the documents because as I mentioned, they had different types, photo, negative film, notebooks, uh, magazines, and other, uh, other like lists uh, of uh, the Khmer Rouge, uh, registration form. So they, they, they divide in, into category. And then we at the time uh, when uh, in between 1991 and 1993, we had a, a, a cooperation with uh, Cornell University to, to make a microfilm, microfilm out of those documents because I mean that the administration or administ uh, the, the, the leaders of the museum at the time had already seen the importance of the documents, uh, those line document archives. So they were uh, Partnership with uh, partner, partner with the, the 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 specialists to come, and they help us to do microfilm. It, in in the in means of, in terms of not not to really touch touch the the real documents, but uh, and then by that time uh, in somewhere in 1993, we have a photograph uh, photo archive groups, uh, Mr. Douglas Niven and uh, and and Chris Relay. Who were in Cambodia at the time, they, they voluntary to have the photograph who were in danger, who were in fracture in condition of deterioration. So they have us to protect and to uh, to, to, to restore uh, the, the photos. So and they, they were allowed to have 100 photos to be to use as an exhibition and to publish a book where you can find the name of the book was Facing the Dead. The deaths. I'm sorry. So this was how the document was uh, was cared, but time by time, and later on in 1993, uh, we have another work with Yale University. I think uh, is also related to what uh, DG Cam had done. At the, it's like a starting point uh, of uh, doing uh, the making the database of a uh, genocide place, prison places all around the country, and by by that project. The, the archive of the museum had been digitized and you can find on jail uh, website, uh, genocide study program, which some of it 
are online already by 1994 or 19, I think maybe 1995, if I'm not wrong. I'm so, I'm so sorry, I'm not so sure about this. So it, it was year by year, but unfortunately, after Yale project, it, this museum seem, uh, I I'm, I'm have to be uh, uh, honest that um, we, have, we still have a lack of capacity news of the museum staff because most of us in 1979 and 80 were recruited. As you know that Cambodians were the victims of genocide. They survived from the genocide and how, how come they want to work for a former crime site. So it was really difficult to find staff working for, as, uh, for our museum. So that's why the government at the time was just trying to, to find somebody who dare or who want to work for the museum. So that then even that was the result to my management system. Now we have different variety, variety of the knowledge of the staff because most of them were recruiting from, from that time. So, I mean, from 1995 to 2003, 2004 and five and six, we have no collaboration with partners. So the, the, the archive which are stored in one building, one long room of the building B, and we have just have uh, the asset free box from Yale uh, program or Cornell program. We have even, we have shelf, uh, shelf for those, but we don't make a really a technical care. I mean, like uh, chemical caring or digitizing. We just made a simple uh, scan. We, we take off clips and, and something like this. So up until when we been registered into memory of the world, we got attention. And finally, in 2014, we got uh, we were lucky that uh, Koika from Korea, uh, a Korean corporation in the International Cooperation Agency, they provide us funding to do a digitization. But, but with technical or bureaucracy work, uh, it take years. So until 10, 10, 2018, we can digitize all those 700,000 pages of documents, photos, negative film biographies, and we put it online. The, the aim of uh, doing this uh, digitization project was first to reduce the physical using from researchers, from, from students. Second, want to give access for public. So anywhere in the world, you can, you can search for the documents, you can search for the photograph, and also to help Cambodian, because even until now, uh, Cambodian people still searching for their family, their lost relative. Sometimes, mostly they, they come to visit the museum and find their relative with the photo exhibition. And now they can find, and they also can find with the names which was inscribed on the marble stone in the museum compound. And certainly now it's more access, more easy for them because they can search for uh, their information of their relatives online. Those they are in the US, they are in Argentina, they are in, in Japan, they can search for that. So it's easy for, for the Cambodian to find their, their lost relative. So this is, I like to just how to, uh, how the, the documents are preserved and why we digitize the documents of, uh, of the, the crimes happening in between 75 and 79. In addition to this, uh, we, as the museum, we have also our four pillars. First, it's about a reflection. Means we try to pre preserve the site and to reflect for what was happening in the past. And also uh, second for remembrance, something like to be built, we create or, or we, we, we did some project and saying to uh, our other panelists were mentioning about documenting the uh, interview or making a record of uh, interviewing. To the museum, we are facing this challenge because we are limited of resources to do so. With those we have server, those we have uh, some knowledge, but we have people who do it. We don't have a really 
proper stuff or to 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 implement that uh, collection. So that. Uh, the, the the second second pillar is remembrance. Third pillar is about education. So that that's why we design different activity to provide to students to younger generation. Like like me, I was but before coming to this place, I was also working like Miss uh, Farina was mentioning. I'm I'm happy doing that because sharing is things that I want and especially about the story of crime to prevent not to be happen. And the last pillar of the museum was healing and justice. We are not, um, uh, again, we are not in the expertise of uh, healing the traumatized. We are not in the expertise of, or we are not the upper, uh, uh, an institution who authorize in finding justice for the victims, but we can support them. Let me uh, tell about how we provide or how we find justice for the victims. Since the start in 79, I think uh, you may have known something about uh, the people tribunal, people re people re revolutionary tribunal in 1979. It was happening between 15 and 19 August 79 and to trial Ying Seri and Pol Pot, the leaders of the Khmer Rouge. At the time, we pro also provide some evidence from the museum, and we have the survivors from the former S21 to be part of the of the of the, of the trial, and then lately. Uh, or I, I would say recently, uh, in, especially in, in 2007, when we have already had agreement with U U United Nations to create a Khmer Rouge tribunal in Cambodia, or we can say uh, extraordinary chambers in the court of Cambodia to trial Khmer Rouge leaders. So the first person to be trialed was the former chief of S21, Gang Gik Il, Alice Duch. During his trial, the museum provided many uh, original documents to to uh, to trial against Dutch because that was the important, the most important and the most uh, authentic document who Dutch cannot deny. It really happened, and then it was showing the crime of Dutch. So this is how we uh, try to 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 seek for justice. We support, we help, we collaborate with partners. And we um, still uh, to, 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 I mean, open for collaboration in, ter in terms of healings, in terms of remembrance, in terms of education and reflection. But I'm, I'm, I'm to be, I have to be honest to you that I'm not expertise in uh, digitization and just working in in general terms so if you have any question or oh, would you mind if I, I share my my screen to show you my website so you can see uh, like Nico like Nico said uh, something visual is more easy yeah, yeah please go okay. ahead Nisai. thank you okay so I'm sorry, it, this, this website is a little bit big because it contains many documents. Let me first go to this and uh, you will see. So this website, uh, you can go into the, the main website of our museum is toolsline.gov.kh and uh, this is it's very general overview of what uh, tool slide is and then you can go to the manual archive here uh, if, if you can see my screen uh, okay so here you can see uh, different this is how it looked like in the former uh, archive rooms what i mentioned is the wooden shelf uh, sorry, this uh, is the, the sorry can, can inside, I, my... yeah I, oh, I don't see the screen now I'm sorry, wait, 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 I'm sorry. Yes, please. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Right. So, could you see my screen now? Uh, everyone, could yes. you see my screen? Yes. Okay. I can see it now. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, I'm sorry that <laughs> I, for, I may, uh, will forget to, to share. So, no uh, the main website you can see here, this is 
really in general about what was like is uh, information about history of the museum. But what I mentioned, if you go to archive men menu here, you will link to another sub, sub website of this. It's about archive. So you can see the photos of the victim is searching for a person. Uh, this is the, the view of a uh, two-slime uh, archive store, uh, store room. And uh, the former one that we have already upgraded for safety reason. And this is how, uh, what about the digitization. So you could understand more inside this. But what I want to, to what I have already mentioned to you here is that uh, people, they can easily search for their relative for Cambodian, I mean, those live in the country or they live abroad. And you can see we have different age, different, uh, how to say, uh, thumbnail or, 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 or platform. Photographic prints, negative biography. So if uh, we go to photographic print, uh, again, I'd like to, to tell you that these all documents happen, uh, happened in between 75 and 79. And you cannot search a for every photos here on this website because with respect to the dignity of the victims, we did we don't show the photos of victims who died under torture, or because Khmerus also did that, also take take that took that picture, so we, you cannot see those picture in in this website. So you can see here the photo of victims, and and. It's easy uh, on the left side, uh, people can search for their, if they know more detail, uh, they can, or they know just a record number or let me type. Uh, I'm sorry, if, uh, this, this, if you know the names of a, of a record number of two slang of, of, of the documents and so on. And, uh, but, um, let me put this one. So you will see the basic uh, information of this person, where they, he come from, whether he's in adults and 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 and, and provenance. Uh, yes, dimen dimension. But uh, if now you can, we want to search because we have a restrict documents as it happened also in every part of the world. We have restrict document. So if you want to, to search more, you need to register, uh, sign in here, and then we will give, you will be given a message what to, to sign in for a deeper research on this website. All right. Okay, I think uh, I would like to stop here yes. and maybe I, I, can, I will have a question afterwards. Thank you, yes. uh, Mr. Safarina yeah. and everyone. Thank you very much, Nisai. Um, I think you have a touch upon um, um, some um, important uh, points, um, especially regarding your effort in archival um, management and preservation and also challenges that you have faced, especially in terms of uh, the lack of uh, human resources, especially after the Khmer Rouge uh, collapse and then many people were killed off and uh, left only um, a handful of experts and, and then uh, they are all, themselves are also victims. So this is a um, um, very uh, interesting and important point to take away. Um, and I would like to um, have some follow-up questions for some of our panelists, um, especially um, for uh, Oscar. Um, if you can share with us uh, some kind of uh, lesson learned or any challenges uh, that you have faced, especially you mentioned some of them already, but um, any like lesson learns that uh, you think uh, we can benefit from, uh, please. Absolutely. Um, so really quickly, I think the first lesson would be always think about who is your user and what they may want to do with your information. Uh, because maybe it's a very small group that, uh, you know, are, is building the archive just for research. Uh, maybe there is something that will go to the public, like we saw with the museum, right? And um, maybe someone will benefit from making it very accessible Sorry, to... Sorry, cannot to... Be Oh, can you... 
Can you hear now, uh, Nisai? Hello? You, uh, miss, but I don't hear. Huh. I can hear Oscar well. Uh, maybe something oh, wrong nice. with the oh, microphone, right. but, um, but we can hear him. We can hear Oscar. Yeah, I, can, I can hear also. Yeah. Oh, maybe, maybe the problem with my internet then. Yeah. Probably. Okay, sorry. That, let's, please. Okay. Oh, no. Oscar, please go ahead. Continue. Sure. Um, so the second thing would be finding out what is already available, who has done something similar um, like in this in this uh, encounter. Thank you again for this brilliant forum uh, to allow us to exchange these um, experiences. And think about maintenance, because uh, in, oh, seems like someone else can hear me. Um, maybe I, I can change my source real quick. I actually that... can hear you well, probably, yeah. Probably, probably Internet or the computer. Channel, yeah. Or maybe translation channel. Oh, could be the translation. I don't know. Um, but, well, finally, the, the, the main point is, uh, if possible, find a community that can support you in the long term. Uh, I think this kind of, this kind of um, exchanges are great for that, like to find other uh, partners to work along the way to be a sounding board to understand if, you know, like testing and uh, reiterating on whatever you build. And this is not necessarily a, a lesson, but more of an offer. Um, at the engine room, we provide uh, what we call light touch support or LITS, where we support activists, organizations, and uh, in general, uh, social change agents uh, to make uh, the most of their data and technology to increase their impact. So I can share the link to our uh, contact form if any of you are interested in uh, learning more and contacting yes. us. Please. Okay, I've shared the link. Oh, and just to mention, the, the form is in English, but uh, feel free to uh, reach out in Spanish, uh, French, or English. Either is fine. All right. Thank you. So anything else uh, you want to add, Oscar? Or... No, just thank you again it's to all, right? everyone who thank attended you. this session. Thank you very much. Um, so maybe to Yvonne, um, if you have anything to add um, to what uh, Oscar uh, has said, anything particular from your organization? Sure, yeah. I mean, I would, I re would reinforce um, Oscar's point about um, the difficulty and the importance of maintenance. You know, I think the people on this call are very familiar with those challenges of migration, of reformatting of all of that, but I think that's something that's overlooked when people are coming to this kind of work um, from uh, have not having done it before. Um, but in terms of like a lesson learned, you know, we, uh, you know, we all have limited resources and we work with groups of limited resources. I think an important thing to share is that preservation is not all or nothing, you know, it's okay to do what you can now to deal with immediate threats and then do more later. Um, and to think about preservation as an ongoing process and what not a one time action. Um, but I think and to add to that and very important point as um, uh, Gustavo and Alberto 
also said yesterday, the importance of proper planning. So making sure that, you know, even if you can't take all the steps now, understanding which steps you do have to take now um, so that you can preserve your ability to preserve later. You know, so for instance, you know, people might not have resources to do um, extensive cataloging now. So focusing on collecting the key provenance and chain of custody information that you can't get later, and then dealing with things like subject headings or access points for users um, later on. Um, I think it also means having good documentation of your workflows, um, choosing interoperable tools. You know, as Oscar said earlier, also choosing tools that your organization has the skills and, and the ability to maintain. Um, and, and, and like, and thinking about, um, you know, long-term needs. So if you're using a spreadsheet instead of an elaborate database, you still have to have a good data structure and you still have to be choosing a tool that will allow you to export that data later so you can migrate it into your fancy new database when you do have that capacity. I think those are the, the, the main things that I'd wanna share. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Uh, these are great suggestions. Um, and, and I'm sure that um, um, most of us learn a lot from this. Uh, same thing with Oscar. Um, and to um, Miguel, um, do you have any um, recommendation, especially you talk about um, um, the transferring of data and, and all this innovative approach uh, to maintain cost effectiveness? Um, any things, uh, any lesson learned that, or, or any recommendation uh, for, for other organizations that want to pursue the same goal as you have done? I think that one of the um, main ideas that might help uh, from our experience is that you do have to initially define what the purpose is or what usefulness that digital archive might have. And then with that, you can specify the characteristics better. For example, the type of archive, the maximum size, whether or not it would be useful. I mean, if it's a document, for example, in PDF format that has text, for example, if you might need optical character recognition, OCR, so that it can be more easily shared, for example. We have learned that uh, in our experience, because initially we began to issue only image files, and that wasn't very useful for our purposes. And the challenge will always be to create digital archives that are of quality and smaller in size, using interchangeable formats, and easy access for users. In the process of digitalization of the documents, it's also really important, we believe, to define a thematic order or a chronological order or some kind of ordering criteria before even starting with the digitalization. And that would allow us to, in the end, have useful information leveraging the data that we gather in that manner. Conversely, we have used a certain innovative technology uh, via websites. So for example, 360 degree images for creating digital archives. And that has allowed us to, or it has facilitated our engagement with the youth so that they learn the material that we are digitizing. Because honestly, the purpose we have, our goal is to disseminate this information, these digital archives, so that the internal armed conflict and all of its causes are learned through dialogue so that they do not happen again. The, these events that took place over 36 years of war in Guatemala. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, so I feel resonate with uh, what you have mentioned about OCR. 
this is something DC Chem uh, is facing, and then we are also trying to find a solution. And uh, we are here from other organizations of participants. And to uh, Nicola, um, if you can share with us your next step um, and uh, make it uh, short about um, what your next step are, um, so that would be great. Yeah, I would just, um, I would just first, I would like to comment that I absolutely uh, second all the um, inputs that were said here, and uh, they are, how to say, <clears throat> seem very obvious, but we must repeat them uh, every time to ourselves. Um, I would just uh, like to, to additionally add that uh, Two, two points. Uh, first point is that it's uh, absolutely absolutely um, uh, necessary uh, to find uh, people who are good to work with because I think that uh, the, the subjects that with, with which we are engaged in is uh, pretty much specific and it includes specific inclination towards uh, human rights issues and combination combination of that and of some kind of um, tech savvy approach. Okay, so by my experience, actually, there is uh, always a um, lack of people who can uh, combine both of these dimensions. Apart from the discussion that uh, the resources we can we can provide our own scarce because of course we are not dedicated or officially recognized archival institution because from the point, from the legal perspective, um, archival, um, archival work is not our primary work, okay? So pretty much depends on your external surrounding in which you work, that's the, that's the first thing. And uh, the second thing is, um, and the second thing is regarding uh, the um, relation between physical records and digital records and the digitization. I would say that uh, everything uh, uh, depends on a good and a sound plan and that uh, minimal approach is often better than a uh, take it all approach. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Nicola. Um, and Ms. I, if you have anything um, or to add, like uh, any recommendation or anything uh, you want to add, uh, please. Um. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I assume that I don't have much uh, recommendation, uh, but uh, just from our, my ex experience working, uh, dealing with uh, the, the digitization and creating a website, because uh, we have already experience that uh, when, when we start digitizing and it worked, it went well because uh, we have the process as well, but the, the next stage is putting into the database uh, and then uh, creating a website because we have missed uh, uh, data in that things. Uh, we missed that part. So I mean that the, 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 the team, they have uh, create. The, we, we we can say that they have, they have made an under underestimation of the workflow because they thought it would be not that big work to do, but actually it's quite a big work. So what my I what out of my experience is that please uh, think that that the data data indexing is really really important stage. Uh, before creating and uh, putting into database and creating a website because two line had already experienced that and uh, it now makes still make us a lot of problem to do verifying with it we still go back and forward so even though the project is finished so that's uh, one of my uh, experience I would like to share uh, it's it's important to do so thank you thank you very much and um, for your uh, great insights and, and sharing your experience with us. And um, I would like to um, request all the participants to give a big applause to uh, our panelists. Thank, Thank you, you very much. So 
Sarah, um, I'm not sure if we still have time for Q&A, uh, so I would like to turn this to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Farina, for facilitating this really fascinating uh, panel discussion. And a big thank you to, to all of our panelists to Nansai, to Yvonne, uh, to Nicola, to Miguel, and to Oscar. Um, I think this was a fantastic conversation to kick off uh, day two of our exchange together. Uh, since we've been connected for a little over an hour and a half at this point, I'd like to suggest that we take a short break um, and then we'll come back and uh, we'll have time for our second panel discussion as well as a Q&A after that. So um, I hope everyone can get some water or tea and a stretch in <laughs> and we'll come back after the break at 45 minutes past the hour um, to resume our session. Thank you again, Farina. Okay, thank, thank you.